Uh, thank you for attending our session. Uh, my name is Bill Woodward from Von Briesen and Roper. Uh, myself, along with Tom Miller of our firm and John Iden, uh, have divided up our uh, session into three separate groups. I will be speaking on earnout issues. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank uh, Cornerstone for continuing the M&A forum, and albeit in a different form, giving Von Briesen and Roper the opportunity to present today. Uh, as with the M&A forum, the M&A market as a whole is entering into uncharted territory. The COVID pandemic has impacted virtually every business worldwide, both negative and positive. Some businesses encountering both negative and positive results across a broad spectrum of impacts. For example, on the negative side, supply chain issues have had a ripple effect on a lot of businesses. Uh, capital purchase budgets, for instance, have been suspended. Uh, Industry-wide, uh, obviously restaurants, hospitality, and travel have been uh, decimated by the effects of COVID. On the, other, on the other side of the equation, the positive side, new markets have been made available for businesses. Uh, PPE, for instance, has generated millions and millions of dollars worth of sales. Uh, profits and sales uh, for a lot of businesses, particularly with essential products, have increased. Uh, other businesses have benefited by uh, a retraction in the market from competitors who have actually left during this period of time. And then on top of that, you have the unique aspect of PPP loans uh, being involved with businesses and how M&A practitioners are going to deal with that it's also a factor to be considered as, as the M&A market moves forward. Uh, the effect of COVID on M&A transactions will come down to an allocation of risk, both of the unknown and the known between the buyer and the seller. Overall, buyers and sellers must now identify the risk factors, identify the source, and then determine whether the impact is long-term or short-term. Oops, I forgot to move the matter forward, but I'll do that right now. All of these factors create uncertainty in the market. The more uncertainty, the more risk. In pre-COVID times, normal, normal valuation gaps were commonly bridged by some sort of seller financing, normally in the form of earnouts. Moving forward, we expect earnouts to bridge the gap not only in valuation, but in the allocation of risk associated with the uncertainty within our markets. As most of you know, deal flow slowed in the second half of 2020. For the most part, it was because the parties could not agree on an allocation of risk due to the unknowns in the market. For example, we had a deal pending uh, at the time that the COVID pandemic hit last February. Um, we represented a seller uh, who was at the stage of having a signed uh, letter of intent moving toward the asset purchase agreement. COVID hit, uh, the seller uh, had to disclose uh, certain impacts. The buyer, on the other hand, changed the valuation and requested a significant increase in earnout terms. Uh, the seller did not want to take the risk associated with the unknown and ended up pulling the business from the market. After several months, things began to normalize and uh, it's anticipated that the business will go back on the market. Uh, moving forward, expecting to have uh, additional earnouts or additional seller financing. Uh, it is anticipated that the buyers will expect the sellers themselves to be in the best position to understand and know the long-term impact of the pandemic on their business and therefore accept more risk through the expanded use of earnouts. Sellers will be more likely to accept the risk of an earnout than they had in the past, as opposed to a direct reduction in a purchase price, particularly when the business has, been, has a history of being solid. Uh, earnouts will not, in most cases, be the frosting on the cake that they used to be. Rather, an earnout will be a key 
component of the purchase price and therefore central to the terms and conditions that are negotiated between the buyer and the seller. Earnouts, by definition, must start with a baseline. Once the baseline is established, the next step is to determine the performance objective that will trigger the payment. The difficulty in establishing the base and triggering objectives will depend on how many of these COVID factors impacted the business and how normalized the business is at the time of the sale. In addition, while the PPP loan proceeds can easily be removed from financial statements, any indirect impact on the quality of the business or on, on uh, how the cash, the additional cash impacted the business in an indirect manner will directly affect the negotiations. The anticipated timing for the normalization of supply and customer relationships to pre-COVID levels will be a factor in determining the length of the earnout. Uh, it is anticipated that earnouts overall, the term will increase due to the uncertainty in the markets again. If a seller is, is confident that the seller has a good handle on the long-term and short-term impacts uh, that have uh, have happened over the last year, uh, the, that seller will use the earnout to maximize the proceeds from the sale. Creativity will be the key. For example, in the past, uh, seller financing was either a seller note, an earnout, or the seller retaining ownership. Uh, now we're looking at using combinations, for instance, where a seller will retain ownership and have an earnout, with the uh, uh, seller ownership being subject to some kind of put at some time in the future, depending on uh, the fair market value of the company as we normalize business relationships. Uh, for the businesses that have defined uh, short-term factors that can be objectified, we expect to see an increase in holdback or escrow terms. Finally, uh, sellers need to be concerned about indirect earnouts, and I say that with quotation marks around it, or uh, indirect purchase price adjustments. Uh, traditionally, uh, purchase agreements uh, contain a variety of ordinary course of business representations and warranties. Uh, for example, a very common one is sense and fill in a date. The seller has conducted business only in the ordinary course of business, and there has not been any event or development that has had a material adverse effect, nor has there occurred any event or development which would reasonably be expected to result in a material adverse effect in the future. Normally a pretty easy representation warranty to give. However, given 2020, defining ordinary has definitely become more difficult. Uh, sellers are gonna need to be very careful to exempt specific COVID-related events from the ordinary course of business representations. Uh, on one hand, a seller may seek to insert a broad reference, a broad exemption saying, you know, anything related to COVID is not subject to this representation warranty. On the other hand, buyers will expect the seller to identify those specific items that are going to be exclusions, and depending on the nature of the business, identifying those items may be very difficult. Uh, businesses that make these representations and warranties and then continue to encounter variances from historical ordinary past what we will consider to be normalization of the business, run the risk of having claims made by the buyer to recover excess purchase price, damages, increase in litigation, which obviously affects purchase price and, and, and the net that any seller will receive. Uh, leading up to COVID, we saw an increase in the use of representation and warranty insurance uh, in middle market transactions, particularly uh, with the advent of COVID and, and how difficult it's going to be for uh, parties to make these representations and warranties with respect to the ordinary course of business, we would expect to see a greater use of insurance 
to cover the risk tolerance between the buyer and the seller. So with that, uh, I'm going to send it over to Tom Miller in our Chicago office, who will be talking about intellectual property. Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Miller. I'm a uh, partner and a shareholder in the Chicago office of Ambreeson and Roper. And I'm here today to talk about intellectual property, both in a general sense, uh, the basic concepts of intellectual property, but also some issues that come up oftentimes in the context of mergers and acquisitions. And if uh, I can take a minute here, I'd just like to share my screen so I can go through um, some of the slides that I uh, put together for you in this regard. There we go. So uh, like I said, I'm here to talk about intellectual property. And the first slide really is just a little bit about my background. I've been a patent attorney for 25 or going on 26 years now primarily in the patent prosecution uh, setting, uh, which means I'm the type of patent attorney that works with inventors and companies on a daily basis to figure out what their ideas are and whether or not they're patentable and then go through the process of, of getting them issued or prosecuted before the US Patent and Trademark Office into issued patents. I also do the same thing in the trademark setting, although there it's referred to as a registration process and also render a lot of opinions or counsel, I should say clients on uh, both pre and post activities with regard to both patents and trademarks, i.e. Uh, in the pre-setting doing searches and seeing if those patents or trademarks uh, are patentable or available. And then after they become issued or registered, whether or not they might have a suit uh, to assert those patents or trademarks against their competitors. Conversely, if they've been put on notice by their competitors that they might be infringing, they'll engage somebody like myself uh, to see what the risks are uh, involved in that. Just briefly, what we'll be talking about today, I wanted to go over the four or five uh, major areas of intellectual property. It might be an uh, overview for a lot of the people in the audience, but I'm guessing some may not really know anything about intellectual property. So I'll cover the basics of what the various types of property, property are and how you'd go about protecting them. And then knowing this is a, an M&A uh, audience that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to, uh, get into the types of due diligence activities which we are often asked to uh, uh, conduct when a company or is looking to uh, purchase or target uh, uh, a company. First of all, uh, the, maybe the most common type of intellectual property out there is a patent. A patent is, believe it or not, a monopoly. You, know, you say the word monopoly is somebody, somebody on the street and they may immediately think it's, well, it's not legal, right? The government will put a stop to it. But a patent is, is, is one exception because it's time limited. A patent is good or monopoly for 20 years from the date that the patent uh, is filed for. Um, but there is something that the inventor has to give up in order to get that 20 year monopoly. And that is they have to publicly disclose what he or she has created. Um, both during the application process, 18 months after the application is filed, it is, is, is published for public inspection to allow the competitors potentially to design around it. But then at the end of those 20 years, um, the ideas set forth in the patent themselves become public domain and anybody can make use and sell the patent, uh, the idea I should say. But for those 20 years, um, the owner of the patent is given the exclusive right or monopoly to prevent others from making and using and selling the idea. Another really common type of intellectual property is a trademark. And I'm sure everybody listening right now can rattle off a dozen or so really common trademarks like McDonald's or Coca-Cola or, or BMW. You know, the marks that we've all just, we see on a daily basis because they're advertised um, all over the place. And, and, and we immediately connote a certain type of quality or product with that mark or word. And you'll see I, I provided one, um, well, a field and team that shall not be named because I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, but you'll you'll see Lambeau Field there is is a, is one of the very many trademarks owned by the, by the Packers organization. But every sporting professional sporting team out there has dozens of its own trademarks, all of which uh, are the property of that that company and cannot be used without the permission of the of the owner of the trademark. It can be a symbol or a logo as depicted here. It can also be a simple one word. It can be a one word or it can be a phrase of words. I also wanted to mention that a mark uh, does require use. We'll from time to time get calls from clients that they, they wanna 
quote unquote, coin a phrase or protect, uh, they come up with a phrase that they want to get a trademark on. But what they may not know is that they have to apply for that mark in conjunction with a specific type of good. They can't just get a monopoly on that phrase. They have to associate it with a, a sporting good or a t-shirt or a line of clothing. So before the reg mark actually becomes registered, um, proof of that use will have to be submitted to the trademark office. The third, maybe really common type of intellectual property is known as a copyright. And I provided a, a, a painting, a famous, the screen painting here uh, as an example there, but it can be, it need to be a painting. It, it can be a novel. It can be a poem or a song or a, a sculpture, any type of artistic uh, expression. And it exists from the very minute that the creator or the author puts the creation in tangible form. In this case, puts a uh, brush to canvas or the uh, author puts pen to paper, as opposed to patents and trademarks, which I'll get into here a little bit later, which will go through a fairly laborious examination process at the USPTO. Copyrights exist from minute one that they are created. And in a similar vein, they are uh, unexamined when the uh, registered with the US Copyright Office, they don't go through any kind of substantive examination. They're essentially mailed in and rubber stamped with a serial number and mailed back to us, leaving it up to the courts to eventually uh, review whether or not the copyright is, is valid and enforceable. A fourth type of uh, common intellectual property, although there's some lesser known subsidiary types of IP, a fourth one it would be a trade secret. And what is a, a trade secret? A trade secret is um, something that is likely patentable, could be subject to patent protection, but for whatever reason, the owner has decided that that bargain is not sufficient. And I gave some examples here. Well, maybe the person views the 20 year trade off is not sufficient and they wanna keep this idea, this secret uh, indefinitely. Well, if they are diligent about keeping it as such, keeping it as a secret, well, then they potentially could do that. Uh, it is subject though to reverse engineering. So if the product is such that somebody can buy the product or you know, chemical compound, take it to a laboratory and, and uh, reverse engineer or figure out exactly what it takes to make it, well then the trade secret could potentially be of no value and you'd be better off going the patent route. Uh, similarly, if, if it's very difficult to determine if your competitors would be infringing uh, your patent, well then maybe a trade secret is the way to go. If, the idea, the patentable idea is actually the way the product is made. And the only way to figure that out, for example, is if you were to visit their factory floor, which you'll never get access to, well then what's the point of getting a patent, right? You wouldn't be able to determine if this would be infringed, in which case a trade secret might be the way to go. Uh, and patents are fairly expensive. So maybe that also might be a, a factor in the client's mind as to which uh, type of intellectual property. And then finally, you know, since we're in a m and conference here, how does all this IP pertain to a typical M&A transaction? Like I said before, I'm a, I'm a patent prosecutor. I, on a daily basis, or the guy that would be getting the patents or the trademarks or counseling on all of the above. But we are from time to time, of course, also asked to undertake or task with a due diligence analysis, i.e. one of our clients wants to buy a target company and they ask us uh, to identified, you know, what do they, what do they have in terms of IP and how, how strong is it? Uh, and those, th that starts the ball rolling and, and what we typically do or what you see there on, on the slide. First, we try and get our arms around exactly what the IP um, portfolio is, what patents and trademarks, both the US and European and whatever foreign countries they might have foreign filed in, what is out there. Uh, the, the company itself, I believe it or not, may, may or may not know, or may, may not know what of those patents and trademarks have been accurately maintained through the years. So we'll, we'll identify all that. But then I think the majority of our time would be spent in uh, studying file histories. So file histories is a term of art in my line of work, which is really just a um, uh, record, the written record of all the argumentation that I make or any patent attorney or trademark attorney would submit to the US Patent and Trademark Office to get these patents and trademarks issued. That's all 90% of the time in written form and made of record. Well, why is that of importance? Well, um, a patent, um, if it's asserted in court someday, the claims will ultimately have to be construed. And those claims will be construed based on what is set forth in the, the uh, specification, the written component that I mentioned before of the patent application itself. 
But even that do doesn't stop it there, the claims have to be construed not just in light of what is written in the application, but what was said in the prosecution phase, i.e. what's in those file histories. So everything I say I, it can and will be used against me in interpreting those claims down the road. So that is of extreme importance in this type of uh, analysis, because then we'll be able to see what was argued um, by the attorney for the target company uh, when those patents were being obtained. And maybe they sailed right through. Maybe the patent attorney who did an excellent job and no arguments were made, no claim amendments were made, and the claims can just be construed as broadly as possible. Oftentimes though, it's somewhere in between. No, there was some relatively close art and he or she had to argue about, about it appropriately. And those arguments can be used to construe what the claims actually should mean. And as a result, how broad that patent is. Same thing in the trademark setting, whatever arguments were made. All of which would lead us to hopefully being able to assign a relative uh, demarcation as to how strong that IP portfolio is with respect to those prosecution histories. We oftentimes step even beyond the file histories though to conduct uh, searches because maybe in those, those file histories, not the most germane patents came to light. And you would wanna know that before you buy the company, right? Before you assign a value to the patent portfolio and buy the company, um, you'd wanna know that, oh, actually there was a, a Smith patent from 10 years ago that just didn't get reviewed. And that has great importance in determining how broadly the claims of your perspective patent can be asserted because it can't run afoul of what the Smith patent said. We'll study all of that and try and uh, explain it in, uh, in business terms to the, the parties that be as to how strong that IP portfolio is. And then if they want to final, take the final step, assign a dollar, dollar value to it, which is um, really an art unto itself and something we often do in conjunction with an accounting house. Um, maybe there are similar deals out there that are of, uh, of record and we can identify what that was sold for in that you know, specific medical device or automotive field or whatever the case may be. Or maybe there's a known range of royalties that these types of patents can, um, can justify. And we'll put that into the overall analysis of the portfolio and hopefully um, aid the decision maker in going forward or not with the merger or acquisition. And I guess that's it, all I had for today. Like I said, time was limited, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out or contact me on any of the numbers or emails listed there on that, on that screen. And with that, I think I will turn it over to John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. As you said, my name is John. I'm a shareholder in the Labor and Employment Practice Group. I practice and work primarily out of the NINA office, spend a fair bit of time up here in Green Bay as well. And as a member of the Labor and Employment Group at the firm, I've been part of the COVID-19 Task Force. I'm going to talk briefly about some issues that are, are hot topics as of right now, but our team has been dealing with this issue and the evolving legislation and the guidance for the last 10 months. So if you're looking for further information, my contact information is included, but our website is also a great resource. And again, it's the COVID-19 Task Force page. My conversations in 2020 have been mostly with employers and specifically HR professionals about updating policies and procedures. Now the impact of that on a, in the M&A world, just like any other due diligence period where you're looking at employment issues, both an employment roster and employment practices for potential liability, COVID-19 is now one of the issues that you should be evaluating during due diligence. Specifically, what has the company's COVID-19 protocol been? What has been their success and what have been their failures? Because we are only at the beginning of the emerging litigation that is gonna come out of COVID-19 and how the, how the company has dealt with it in the past 10, 12 months is gonna be a really strong indication of whether or not there's any claims, either known or unknown, that are on the horizon. So as I said, I have a limited amount of time here in COVID-19 and its impact on the workplace has been a, a significant issue, but I wanna talk about three of the issues that I'm getting questions on and discussing most frequently with clients right now. The first is, what is the legal significance of all this guidance we're hearing about? The CDC guidance, the, local, the state and local health department guidance, what are the potential legal ramifications if we're not able to or unwilling to follow the guidance? 
We're going to talk briefly about some frequently asked questions related to COVID, COVID protocols. Then we're going to touch on the EEOC's current guidance regarding vaccinations and an employer mandate of vaccinations. And then finally, some employment considerations in the most recent federal COVID-19 relief bill. So looking first at the legal significance of guidance and what, again, are the potential legal consequences or exposure if the guidance hasn't been followed. Now, as it suggests, it's just guidance. There is no private cause of action for failure to follow. If you don't have a mask policy, well, currently masks are mandated at statewide. If you are not strictly enforcing a social distancing policy, for example, in your workplace, there is no state or federal agency that is going to come in and issue a citation or a fine or a judgment. The way that the guidance is going to play, and is, as, we're, as we're seeing now in the early litigation, the impact of the guidance is that it is being used to set the standard of care. And the claims are largely based in a theory of negligence, the argument that the employer failed to meet their standard of care, meet their duty or obligation to their employees or their invitees because they didn't follow the guidance. Now, the concept of negligence, it's a civil tort, the, the easiest explanation or the easiest example is ice and snow in Wisconsin. Now, there's a safe place statute, there's a general duty under OSHA. There are a number of different legal arenas where the standard of care exists. But generally, it stands for what a reasonable person would do in similar circumstances. So if someone were to slip and fall on your premises, there is not absolute liability because someone was injured on your property. The question is whether or not you exercise reasonable care in maintaining the safety of your premises. And the, the fact-specific analysis in the snow and ice example is what is your snow removal protocol? Who is doing it? Are you doing it yourself? Are you contracting it out? How often do they come? What is their experience? Have you had a history of complaints regarding their performance or it's not done correctly or not done by opening? All of these specific facts go to whether or not you as the business owner met your standard of care. The same type of analysis is happening in the COVID arena. So the facts of the early litigation that we're seeing in some of the larger department stores, there was a case I believe out of Illinois with a Walmart store where an employee contracted COVID-19 and unfortunately passed away. And the estate, the family members, filed a lawsuit uh, alleging wrongful death. And the argument was that the employer was on notice of COVID-related risks, failed to exercise reasonable care in implementing precautions, and it was their negligence that led to the employee's passing. So whether or not you have these protocols in place, again, is not the, the question of liability, but failure to implement these reasonable protocols is going to be used as evidence that you are not meeting your standard of care. So what you would be looking for, or what the recommendation is, is one, you want to have either at your company or the company that you're looking at acquiring should have a COVID-19 point person who can tell you that they've been following the guidance and who can tell you what their implementation measures have been. And if they haven't, been exercising that reasonable care, if they haven't been keeping up on guidance, and if they haven't passed policies and procedures consistent with the guidance, that's a potential red flag. The next follow-up question would be, have you had people working from home? Have you had people in the office? Have you had positive cases? Failure to follow the guidance is step one when there's a a negative case or a negative outcome of a positive case as step two, you're that much further down the road for potential liability. Going through briefly some of these frequently asked questions, should employers perform their own contract tracing? And if they do, what should they say in the workplace regarding a positive test result? There are concerns. HIPAA has a, has a very limited application to healthcare providers and some business associate agreements. So most employers think that there's HIPAA violations when they're just talking about health conditions. Generally, that's not true. However, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, there is a confidentiality provision that does require employers to maintain the secrecy of, of protected health information. So it's, a, it's very similar to a HIPAA protection. So should employers perform contact tracing? Absolutely. If there's a positive test, or excuse me, a positive case in the workplace, you should absolutely contact 
the individuals who have worked in the close proximity of the positive case. Now, if there's a positive case from someone who works from home, you don't need to contact Trace. If that positive case has been in the work environment, then absolutely have conversations. The conversations are just generally putting them on notice and asking if they've had any symptoms. Depending on your protocol, you may also send them home for a period of time to monitor symptoms. Should I tell employees when someone tests positive? That's, I answered it in the, in the first response, but yes, but not the name of the individual. People are gonna be able to put together the context clues. I'm working with five people and this one hasn't been here for two weeks. They will likely know, but you don't wanna be the one to disclose the name. What forms of job protected leave are available now that the FFCRA has expired? We're gonna talk a little bit about the new COVID relief bill and the fact that the tax, uh, the tax exemption for FFCRA type leave still exists. However, the, the ex expanded family medical leave and the emergency paid sick leave have both expired as of December 31st, 2020. So now we're back into the world of traditional FMLA, reasonable accommodation leave under the ADA, and then whatever the employer's practices are with regard to sick leave and paid time off. So now, again, the COVID-related absences are really only protected if they're related to a disability or they rise to the level of a serious health condition and the employer is covered by traditional FMLA. And then finally, can I discipline an employee who repeatedly reports close contact or symptoms consistent with COVID-19? The short answer is yes, but definitely proceed with caution here. I, the, the point of this question is that COVID-related absences is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It isn't a, a license for unlimited time off. It isn't you can't ask further questions about where the, the alleged contact came from. or I, All of that is fair game. You can investigate these issues like any other uh, discipline issue or attendance issue, but again, proceed with caution because there are some protections and potential pitfalls. Wrapping up here, I, I want to just again touch on the EEOC guidance regarding vaccinations. We're getting some questions primarily from healthcare employers because they're the ones that have access to the vaccine at this stage. Can we mandate the vaccine? The, the short answer is yes. There are requirements under Title VII that you provide accommodations for those with disabilities who cannot take the vaccination and those who have legitimate religious beliefs that present, prevent vaccination. Um, on that second point, the legitimate religious beliefs that prevent or prohibit vaccination, be mindful of the legitimacy or validity of these claimed religious beliefs. I, I, not to be skeptical of, of any religious beliefs, but I will say that when we had the mask mandate in the early stages of the mask mandate, there was this freedom to breathe agency that was selling actually online um, fake cards that said, present this if asked why you're not wearing a mask. The card just said, freedom to breathe agency, I have a disability, you, can't, you cannot ask me for additional information. I actually had a client who had that presented to them by one of their employees. The organization is completely fake. The cards were a total scam. They had no legal bearing and certainly no legal significance. Um, I, not to be skeptical, but there's a fair chance that there's going to be something similar to that if an employer tries to mandate vaccines. On that point, I will say that there is a state bill pending that I believe has passed the uh, state assembly, is currently before the state senate or vice versa, but in that pending state bill, there is a prohibition on an employer mandated vaccine. So we may see state intervention that addresses the employer mandate, but at the federal level, there is no legislation prohibiting it, and the EEOC guidance is that an employer can mandate. Finally, the updates on the latest COVID relief bill. The, the main point to pull out of the bill was that the FFCRA expired at the end of 2020. We're all waiting to see whether there was gonna be an extension into 2021. And what the legislature did was that they, they continue the tax credit for COVID relate, or excuse me, for FFCRA paid leave through March 31st, 2021, which allows employers to voluntarily extend the time period for employees to use FFCRA leave. Now, in my experience early on in this year, 
I haven't had any clients ask to extend the leave, but if you are, as a company, are extending the leave, or if you're looking at acquiring a company that has extended the leave, you want to pay close attention to what the policy is. Hopefully they've passed a policy regarding their extension, and hopefully that policy contains specific language with an end date on that extension. The, any extension should end as of March 31st, 2021. One, that's because the tax credit expires as of March 31st, but two, we have some very interesting developments at the federal level, and if the Senate goes Democratic as the House is already Democratic with a Democratic president, there's likely to be a new version of FFCRA. So proceed with caution as an employer for the additional benefits that you're adding or the FFCRA that you're extending because the federal government may be imposing on top of that additional paid leave benefits. I believe that's my time. Thank you so much for attending our session and I hope to see you all at the Q&A session.